I will take map of G to G. Okay, and you would like to see what the tangent map of this D in G is by definition at G. The differential between G is what you have to compute. How will you compute the differential between G? So, you take a tangent vector and you would like to know what the image is tangent vector is. A tangent vector is integral to some curve. In this case, if you take the tangent, tangent, say tangent vector x at E, which is identified the element of G, exponential T x will give you the tangent vector. So, to x, x T x. is a curve tangential to x. So, in G x t x G inverse is the image curve. And you will want the tangent to this curve tangent to the curve will be the image of x under the differential. I have taken a tangent vector, how will I calculate the image of the tangent vector? Take some curve tangential to it, take the image of the curve and take the tangent. Huh? In, oh sorry, what I mean is this. that is in G applied to x t x. So, it is tangent to this curve is how, how you get it. So, tangent to this at identity is add x sorry is uh, add g on x. Okay. So, <coughs> I cal calculate add g on x. Now, I you want to calculate small add, right? Okay. So, if I add g, so mapping from <coughs> g to glfg. Once again, what do I do? I take, I want to calculate the tangent to this curve. Take again x t x for instance. Apply this. So, what you find is this. Uh, small add x will be d by d t small add x on y so, d by d t of uh, add x t x add x t x is the curve and then add x t x on y this add x <coughs> at d by d t at equal 0 that is this by definition is add is going to be add x y and this you know is bracket x y because of the way we defined we, uh, I said a dilemma when you have two vector fields x y you can take the one parameter group of one of the vector fields apply it on the other one in d by d t that is how you get it this is the way it is. So, from the that is why it is equal to bracket x y. Okay. Now, last time I ended the lecture with the statement of Hadoff's theorem. It states that any finite dimensional Lie algebra G admits the representation on characteristic zero of 
admits the representation rho g to g l b with kernel rho 0. So, one consequence is I am I am not going to prove this theorem. It takes a lot of machinery which one has to develop. So, I will not prove this theorem, but uh, you will find the theorem in any standard book on Lie algebras. I do not know if it is is it in Sayers book on complex simple Lie algebras. Sir, the right hand side is small g, right? Sorry? It is g to small g. G 2? Where is some finite dimensional representation. No, no, oh, so the M N V, sorry, N V, sorry. All right. Yeah, N V, endomorphism of with kernel rho equal to zero. Uh, I mean, uh, the book from which I, there is a book by Jacobs on on Lie algebras, for instance, which will contain certainly contain a proof of this. There is, of course, uh, most of you people probably won't read French, but if you read French, there's a Bourbaki volume on Lie algebras, which gives you what you want. I pass huh? Humphreys Sayers book on uh, Sayers has a lecture notes Benjamin lecture notes no, no. Har Harvard lecture notes which has come out now in uh, as a book Springer, Springer called Lie, Lie groups Lie algebras and Lie groups. But uh, the point of view taken by Sayer is a little different Okay, and uh, he does not do things this way. Yeah, yeah, that is one D book which combines both periodic and real Lie groups and has all the material I am talking about. Uh, there are uh, certain advantages in that approach, but uh, there are also some advantages in the way I am doing things. For one thing, I think uh, this is a little quicker than Sayers work. Sayers, as a. As you pointed out, hmm? proves Carton theorem at the end after proving. Right, right, right. Now, the only new feature in which differs from uh, any literature is that I first prove Cartan's theorem and then deduce Lee's theorem. And uh, the, I do not know many of you may be familiar with the other uh, proof of Lee's theorem which uses the so called Frobenius theorem for involutive distributions, which is a theorem in differential geometry, which I am not using it. I am using it in a special case. The fact that a closed form is locally exact is exactly the Frobenius theorem for co-dimension 1 distributions. That is where the distribution means at every point you are given a subspace of the tangent space. If that tangent space is of co-dimension 1, that particular case is what I was dealing with. So, the Cartan theorem enables me to reduce it to the co-dimension 1 case. And uh, of course, I did not prove the theorem for uh, the, the, the fact that every uh, um, closed form is locally exact. It is not something which I proved, but it is once again Analytically, it is very easy. So, so, you write power series and then you equate coefficients, you get conditions you want, and convergence is easy to prove. So, it is completely see all the theorems I am using from differential geometry are easy to prove using just power series, and you know, you have to prove all the time you prove there is a formal solution and then prove convergence. That is that is the way you do it. They are all you they all follow the same pattern of so called method of majoration. You can always find a real series which for which the theorem is approved directly, and then you can deduce it because the formal solutions of the periodic or uh, general uh, uh, field, the formal solutions will be the coefficients of the formal solution will be majorized by the coefficients of the solution which you know in the real case, and then of course convergence will follow. That's that's the general procedure. Okay, Ados theorem says this. And as a corollary, of course, which I also pointed out last time, that given a Lie algebra, this is true over an arbitrary algebra, uh, arbitrary field K, but given a Lie algebra over <coughs> a periodic or Archimedean field K, given a Lie algebra with G, there exists a Lie group. G for which whose Lie algebra such that Lie G is isomorphic to G. That is an immediate corollary as I pointed out follows from this theorem. Simply 
for this, we know that this is the Lie algebra of the Lie group GLV. And you apply Lie's theorem for a sub algebra of a subgroup, Lie subgroup. That's it. So that's the characteristic zero field. Characteristic zero is important. No, no, no. Uh, no we, I'm, when I talk of K, I'm only talking of periodic fields which are characteristic zero. Periodic fields are characteristic zero fields. They're not characteristic P fields. <coughs> it's curious because uh, when I was a graduate student in my, up to my third year, I always thought periodic fields were characteristic P. <laughs> then suddenly I realized one day that they're not, they're Characteristic zero fields. Anyway. <coughs> hmm? There was a GA for reference. Right? There used to be some lecture notes by you. Some, it was not uh, Not published. Not even typed, I think. It not even typed, yes. I have uh, my so handwritten uh, copy. See, well, the, in the last 15 years, I've been trying to make it into a book. <laughs> I, I promised a book uh, for the trim series to Bhatia. 15 years ago, but I have not got out of the first place. I mean, I wrote, I did write something, but uh, not satisfied. Go. I keep going back to it now and then, but it's nowhere near completion. On the other hand, uh, I've given the, this kind of thing in lectures uh, after the, the first time I did it was 1976 in TAFR. But after that, I've done it at least twice, uh, given this kind of lecture. Oh, this is the third time I'm doing it here, <laughs> if you like. OK. Now, every time I'm, you know, I always think maybe I'll get some student to write the notes, and then okay, it makes it easier for me to write the book, but hasn't worked out. <coughs> this time, some student. Hmm? This time, some student. No, this time, you know, I, I kind of condense it. For a book, it has to be more elaborate. So this, this time, that's why I didn't even try it, uh, saying somebody should take notes and so on. So. <laughs> Okay. There exists the Lie group such that. So this clearly, I mean, and on the other hand, given a group, of course, it has its Lie algebra. So there's a bijective correspondence between. Not, I mean, I shouldn't say bijective. If I restrict the group in some way, then mild restrictions, then I can say there's a bijective correspondence between group and its Lie algebra. So let me. Next, so this correspondence. G to Lie G. It's a functor from the category of Lie groups to the category of Lie algebras over the field K. <coughs> it's a nice functor. It has nice properties. I mean, it, it, one can deduce lots of properties of the group G using this functor for Lie algebras. The first uh, proposition we'll prove if G is a Lie group over K, then and let's write and G prime, maybe I'll call it G zero, the subgroup generated. By a sufficiently small neighborhood, <coughs> of one, then G not the complete subgroup G not G not is a Lie subgroup. With bracket of G not G not Lee G not Lee G Lee G Lee G as its Lee algebra. The point is. Uh, I cannot assert that bracket GG has its itself as the commutators Li Li G, but if I take a sufficiently small neighborhood, then for the group generated, the commutator subgroup has 
bracket GG is real algebra. When the group is real or complex, any and connected, any neighborhood of the identity will generate all of G. So let me make a remark. If G is connected, which of course will mean, if G is non trivial, it necessarily mean that the field is complex or real numbers. G is connected, one can assert then <coughs> G not equal to G. In other words, in th for connected real D groups or complex D groups, the commutator subgroup is the least subgroup with that as the with the with the commutator algebra of the Lie algebra as the com as the Lie algebra. How does one prove this? Once again, <coughs> start with you have uh, <coughs> the Lie algebra G. Notice that the Lie algebra G is the same whether you take capital G or capital G zero makes no difference. Any open neighborhood, the same tangent, it has the same tangent space, so the Lie algebra coincide. You have a natural mapping from G to bra G by bracket G G. This, of course, is a vector space, which I let me write Lie. It's a Lie group in its own right. And look at G cross E. And in this, you have the subalgebra. Sorry, G, Lie algebra of G cross E is obviously Lie G cross E. E can be identified with its own Lie algebra. <coughs> and you have in this the subalgebra x by x. So, you have a corresponding subgroup, Lie subgroup. Get Lie subgroup. Yeah. Mm. Lee subgroup, uh, let us call that uh, gamma pi. So, we have the following picture G cross C e and gamma pi. I mean, that is the you know, mapping like this Lee subgroup. Corresponding to that, and of course your projections here to G, the Cartesian projection, and also to E. So gamma pi is a Lie subgroup. So you have an analytic inclusion here, and a projection down there. So you get a map like this. Of course, that map on on knows from the definition of this, it is clear it induces isomorphism in the Lie algebra. Therefore, it will induce an isomorphism of a neighborhood of identity, analytic isomorphism of neighborhood of identity in gamma pi and neighborhood of identity in G. If we are in a periodic situation, these neighborhoods can be taken to be groups, compact groups. So, k periodic choose neighborhood omega of 1 of identity in gamma pi such that let me call this mapping something some name phi phi restricted to omega such, such that omega is a compact group. And phi from omega to phi omega is an isomorphism. 
call phi omega to be g naught like then phi inverse gives an isomorphism of g naught on omega here so get by taking inverse p1 sorry p2 composed with phi inverse is an isomorphism of uh, g naught is a homomorphism of g naught into e so mapping it in abelian group so the kernel is completely contained in kernel is uh, kernel contains the commutator subgroup so kernel of this let's call this map lambda kernel lambda contains commutator kernel lambda is a closed subgroup and contains the commutator subgroup because it's a home of the abelian group so the kernel must contain the commutator subgroup On the other hand, the real algebra of kernel lambda is precisely bracket by our definition because you are looking at the differential map of, lam of lambda can be identified with differential map of pi, uh, the, with, with pi. Once you identify the real algebra of G with the real algebra of gamma pi, pi is the map. So you find that Lie algebra of kernel lambda is precisely bracket G. And therefore, the, in fact, therefore follows that uh, G naught, uh, what I call it, the kernel lambda bracket G G's and therefore kernel lambda is precisely Lie subgroup corresponding to bracket G G. We need to show that we still have to show that one what what one has proved is the following that kernel lambda contains bracket G G and we would like to show that bracket G G is contained in kernel lambda as well. <coughs> Clearly bracket G G is an open subgroup in kernel lambda because the Lie algebra of bracket G G is kernel lambda. We have seen yeah the Lie algebra kernel lambda what I want to say is the real algebra of kernel lambda is clearly how should I put it? I am not saying it right. Mm. Kernel lambda contains what we have shown is kernel lambda contains uh, the commutator. So, um, we need to prove that the commutator is contained in kernel lambda. So, this is the other way inclusion bracket G G. No, no. No, the contains kernel lambda is what to show. <coughs> but the subgroup corresponding to I am a little a bit lost here. Mm. You have to prove that bracket G G contains kernel lambda, which means what? Uh,
sorry, I seem to be missing something here. It's not, it's not difficult to prove, but I don't, I don't know what I'm missing. Hmm? Sorry. See, you know, the problem is that one has to know that bracket GG is the least sub group. Only then I can talk of the Lie algebra. No, I think uh, bracket GG is uh, a close subgroup of G. Sorry? Bra bra see the no uh, it is a closer group but you have it, it's not clear that it's true if you take a compact group and take commutators you have to take the group generated and that's not clear it is closed you, the, the closer of course is a Lie group but then it all that you can say is it contains the commutator group so that we what you really have is kernel lambda contains bracket gg so the thing uh, let me see. Mm. Yeah. Right. Let's see. Uh, I want to prove that uh, bracket GG contains kernel lambda. Okay. Uh, <coughs> what are the elements of bracket gg like look like they look, look like g at g inverse h inverse and if our neighborhood is sufficiently small all the g and h are in the exponential image so let's look at something like g x t x g inverse x minus t x What do I want to prove? And I want to say that uh, bracket GG contains kernel lambda. We have already defined that this closure contains kernel lambda. Right. Okay. Okay. Sure. We have, we have to show that. Yeah. In fact, in the in the periodic case, uh, no, not quite. Hmm. G x t x. If I look at G G inverse, it looks like this. Um, I'm getting a bit lost. I don't, don't know. I think I'll skip the proof. You take it for granted and try to work it out yourself. It's not difficult. Okay. I know it's not difficult because I've done it before once. <laughs> but somehow I'm, I'm not able to. I don't want to spend time on that because there's so, more, so many more things I have to tell you anyway. So, <clears throat> you fiddle something like this. Uh, Which way is it? Kernel lambda contains bracket GG is clear. I want to take uh, anything in kernel lambda is contained in this, is what I have to prove. Everything is limit of this uh, Yeah. Uh, so if, some, if something is in kernel lambda, lambda is that whole morphism. Mm. So, I mean, Yeah, so it's enough to prove that uh, all commutators are in kernel lambda. If you, if I prove that all commutators in kernel lambda, I'm done, right? Because the commutators generate bracket GG. Oh, kernel lambda contained in bracket GG is what I want. I'm, I'm getting totally confused. Okay. So what do I have to show that I have to show that uh, anything in kernel, kernel lambda elements in elements in kernel lambda are generated by the commutators is what I have to prove. Anything in kernel lambda is a product of com commutators is the kind of thing I have to prove. Anything in kernel lambda. But uh, yeah. No, I am I'm not I'm not able to see that immediately. 
but work it out. It, it's it's not difficult. Mm. Okay, so you starting with the group G and yeah, in the what happens in the case when K is real? <coughs> in that case, you know, once again, there is an analytic neighborhood where omega to phi omega is an isomorphism, and you can go through. You replace what you do is to replace gamma pi, you replace G by simply connected cover. Don't take G to be simply connected. Connected and simply connected. Then this mapping can be inverted. And the rest of the proof goes through. The only problem here is that in the PID case, we could simply take a compact open subgroup here and say it maps isomorphically, and I can invert. I can't do that in the real case. Unless I, however, if I take G to be simply connected, then I'm in good shape. That, that's the job. So when k equals r or c, take g to be simply connected. And go through that. And then for a non-simply connected g, you simply take the commutator and project from the cover, universal covering back to g. If the g is not simply connected, take g tilde, do everything there, project down, then you're done. That's the kind of thing. Okay, k. So that is, takes care of the case when k is real or complex. <coughs> so, start. An immediate corollary is the following: the Lie group G is solvable as a group. Then the Lie algebra G is solvable. Solubility means that you have a sequence of ideals such that the successor, successive quotients are abelian. In the case of Lie algebra, you have a sequence of ideals such that the successive quotients are abelian. <coughs> and it's clear, once you know that the Lie algebra is bracket GG, you can keep on doing it. If G is soluble, at some, at some point, the commutator quotient, commutator sequence will end in identity. Corresponding Lie algebra will end up in zero, so you get this. You have to prove slightly something more here if to, to get the corresponding statement for nil potents. Corollary one, corollary two. It's not quite a corollary, but anyway. Uh, ah, the co yeah. Then G solve. Conversely, if G is soluble, any subgroup of G. generated by a sufficiently small neighborhood is soluble. You need a sufficiently small, small neighborhood because here also you need a sufficiently small neighborhood at one stage. And a similar statement is true when you replace soluble with nil potent. Now, for nil potent, you can actually adapt the same argument, but, but you have to prove something more. If you have two subgroups, H and G, H1, H2, the commutator group generated by the commutators of H1, H2 has for Lie algebra, the Lie algebra generated by the corresponding Lie algebra. That's one way of doing it. But the pleasanter way of is to look at the center. You say that the center, if the, once again, if the neighborhood is sufficiently small and take the group generated, the center of the group has for its Lie algebra the center of the Lie algebra. And that's e e quite easy to prove because you just have to take exponentials and say they, co they commute. That's it. So this nilpotent case you start with, you know, the, the, the nilpotent groups always have non-trivial center. 
pass the quotient, take the center again and again, you can go on like that. So, nilpotent case, what, ha what happens is this. You handle it by show the show first that center G equals Lie algebra of center G naught group generated by sufficiently small neighborhood of identity. That is the way it works. <coughs> so, it follows therefore, that to study groups, a lot of information can be got out of the Lie algebra, solubility, nil potents all come out of that. And therefore, the groups here to, yeah, let me also. Yeah. The soluble radical of G by definition is the maximum normal nil potent, sorry, maximum soluble subgroup of G. And that is the definition. It follows immediately from these considerations the following. The following thing follows that is, namely, the Lie algebra of the soluble radical is the maximal soluble ideal. of Lie G, soluble radical of G provided <coughs> this is if G is generated by sufficiently small neighborhood. So, everything is applicable only to some groups generated by sufficiently small neighborhood of or in the real or complex case if the group is connected because every sufficiently small neighborhood, every neighborhood generates the whole group, connected group. Okay. So, it is very satisfactory in the real case, the, com the correspondence how nil potent solubility behaves, it is per perfectly satisfactory. In the PID case, you have to exercise some caution, you always have to go to some neighborhood usually let go to a compact open subgroup which is sufficiently small. Then the statement from the Lie algebra can be can be taken over and applied to the <coughs> group as well. Okay. So and for the rest of the lecture I am going to concentrate on Lie algebra because I know how to get theorems about Lie groups from statements about Lie algebra. So and Lie algebras are in some sense easier to deal with because it is a linear algebra basically what you are going to apply methods. <coughs> yeah, uh, Notice that there is always a maximum normal soluble subgroup because if you take two soluble groups the group generated by the two is automatically soluble. So, <coughs> you have to be a little careful uh, in some sense. Uh, things will work out only if uh, G is compactly generated, which is okay in the real case. In the PID case, you have to be somewhat careful. It should be generated by a compact subset, because then you can say modulo a compact open subgroup will be finally generated, because you can't, you should not get into a situation when the normal subgroups keep on increasing, that kind of thing you have to avoid. So. Okay. All right. Uh, so, but the kind of you know, when I look at compact groups, there's no problem. You, you're not going to have uh, 
indefinitely increasing compact groups. They're all open, so if the union is a whole, sp whole group, then it's already a finite union will do the job. <coughs> okay. Yeah. So now, to structure of Lie algebras. And when you study Lie algebras, you can simply forget the fact that the field is evaluated. This works over any field of characteristic 0. G a Lie algebra. over a field k of characteristic 0. Then as I said, G has a maximal. We are all we're looking at finite dimensional algebra. So it's obvious that G has a maximal solvable ideal. R called the radical. Or soluble radical to be more precise. Because there's another nil radical which will also will also come across, soluble radical of G. And of course, G by R has no let's call this has no soluble ideal. You have G to G by R. The point is if this had a soluble ideal, I can take the inverse image that will produce a soluble ideal in G. If you have an exact sequence 0 to R 1 to R 2 to R 3 to 0, if R 1 R 3 are soluble, so is R 2. If any, if R 2 is soluble, R 1 R 3 is also soluble. So, because of that, there is a, this has no soluble ideal, which of course implies it has no abelian ideals. or nil potent ideals. Obviously, these are all equivalent conditions. And one defines a Lie algebra to be semi-simple or no non-zero, I should say. There is no non-zero abelian ideals. Here also non-zero nil potent ideals. It's if and only if, because notice that if G by R has a soluble ideal, then by taking successive commutators, which are all ideals, you end up with an abelian ideal. So if it has no soluble ideal, of course it has no nilpotent ideals, or no abelian. Ideal. All three are equivalent conditions. Notice also that if uh, if a Lie algebra G is soluble, first of all you can find an ideal such as the quotient is abelian, which means you can actually find a codimension one ideal, in which you can find a codimension one ideal, and so on. So G is soluble if and only if there exists subalgebras. G containing G1, G2, etc., GK equal to 0 with GI plus 1, an ideal in GI of co dimension 1. In other words, GI plus 1 by GI is of dimension 1 and therefore necessarily abelian. This is an if and only if statement, it is quite easy to prove, you can see. Because if you look at G, bracket G, G will be contained in G1. Since the quotient by G1 is abelian, bracket G, G will be contained in G1. Then bracket of that will be contained in G1, G1 and so on again. So, because of this, it is an equivalent condition. Solve.
Now, it's a definition now. A Lie algebra G. So, a soluble Lie algebra is built up step by step by one dimensional spaces. Okay. So, a Lie algebra G is semi simple. If it is not abelian, if, if it has no non zero proper, no proper, well, um, there is no proper. Non zero abelian ideals and it is also not abelian and it is not, it's not itself abelian. A one dimensional Lie algebra has no proper abelian ideals, it is either the whole or zero. So, to avoid that, you make sure it is not abelian itself. A Lie algebra G is semi simple if it has no proper non zero abelian ideals it is not itself abelian g is said to be simple this is definition of sim simple this definition of simple is that g has no proper g is semi simple and has no proper ideals So, if it has no proper ideals at all, then you call it simple. It turns out any semi simple Lie algebra is a direct product of simple algebras. That requires some proof, it is not, it's not easy. I okay. will tell you something about it presently. But let me tell you, give you some examples of uh, <coughs> simple algebras. Simple Lie algebras. First example S L N K set of X in M and K of trace zero. S L N K has no proper ideals. That's an exercise for you. What you do is, I mean, to give you a hint, start with any matrix, take its bracket with something like Eij that will produce things which are simpler than x, and then you find that all the Eijs will be captured. And when, once you take the bracket of Eij and Eji, you capture a diagonal matrix that will you can capture all diagonal matrices. Trace 0 is important. See, uh, if you take bracket of Mnk, Mnk that will be, I mean, take a bracket S L N K, S L N K, that will be an ideal. But bracket of any two elements x, y, the trace is 0. So, that is how the trace 0 condition comes up. So, to make sure that <coughs> it is not equal to its, it's uh, the, it, the commutator is, is itself use the fact that everything there has to be trace 0. <coughs> you know, the corresponding group G L N K you can talk of the group G and K. The, when I say corresponding group, I mean it in some senses. You know, we, we are not working with uh, local fields, uh, you know, locally compact fields, so I am not going to. But G and K obviously corresponds in some sense to S L and K. And S L and K, capital S L and K, t t that is a simple group modulo its center. Modulo its center. Provided k, well, I, it's it's for n greater than or equal to four. It's always true, and 
for n greater than equal to 0 and also for n equal to 2, 3 if you avoid if mod k I do not remember uh, should be in the case of 2 there are some low cardinality fields which have to be avoided. In the case of 3 again some low cardinality I do not remember which ones I will leave it at that, but it is essentially all these groups are simple groups mod of the center. This is the first uh, simple groups which people discovered after the a n s n greater than equal to 5 that was discovered in earlier stage they discovered that s l n k is simple modulo its center and when k is a finite field you get finite simple group. Does s l n k have a non trivial Sorry? It can have a non trivial center for instance if you take s l n c roots of unity scalar scalar matrices which are roots of unity will give you n, n roots of unity will give you something. So, that is why that could pass the quotient by the center. Second example is SO SYN F with uh, n greater than or equal to 3. Again is simple. I take a quadratic form over k and take matrices whose entries are in k and preserve the quadratic form provided n is greater than equal to 3 f is a quadratic form in n variables. Hmm? Sorry? Yeah. f a non degenerate quadratic form. Oh, I should say let me write small s. What do I mean by this? I will come to that quadratic form over k. This is again is a simple Lie algebra. What do I mean by this? This is the set of matrices x in <coughs> m and k with the property that f of well um, let me write I will write b f I will tell you what b f is presently b f on x v w plus b f on v x w is 0. What do I mean by this? b f of v w by definition is f of v plus w minus f v minus f w. That is a bilinear form. Whenever I have a quadratic form f, f of v plus w minus f v minus f w is a bilinear form. In fact, it is practically the definition of a quadratic form. A quadratic form, of course, you think of it as a quadratic polynomial, form is a quadratic polynomial, but you can also think of it as a bilinear form. A quadratic form gives you just a bilinear form like this, and you can go back from the bilinear form to the quadratic form by simply bf v v. To do that, you get f of 2 v minus this, but you divide by 2 finally. So, this is the by definition if you, if you if you are working over a periodic field or a, a real or complex numbers, you have this, this becomes a Lie group and what you got is the Lie algebra of the Lie group. Basically, what one is doing is uh, different see if you take a one parameter group in the thing and apply to a vector and differentiate the condition that f is preserved transforms into this condition. When you take the you know what is see preserving the, the quadratic form or the corresponding bilinear form it is equivalent completely. And what we are doing is uh, essentially a Leibniz like formula for differentiation. So, this is another example of <coughs> simple algebra and one more example again is something which I indicated when I defined Lie groups. I gave, when I gave examples of Lie groups, I gave a third example. Namely, S p and k, S p 2 and k. 
let a k n cross k k 2 n cross k 2 n oh uh, a quadratic form I should say when is it non degenerate when the corresponding bilinear form is such that b of v w if it is for a fixed b if b of v w is 0 for all w then v itself has to be 0 that is the definition of non degeneracy and vice versa symmetry notice that the bilinear form is symmetric bilinear form v w can be interchanged. So, I look a map uh, uh, a bilinear map from k 2 n k 2 is called is an alternating bilinear form is an alternating form if a x y equals a y x. And then if an uh, a is non degenerate in the case of any form I did not write it down, but now I will write it down if a x y equals 0 for every y implies x equals 0 that is called a non degenerate form. Minus oh yeah sorry I forgot minus a x y a x y should be minus if a x y equal to a y x we call it symmetric which is this is an alternating form. So, a x y is 0 for every y equals and it is a basic result in linear algebra that if you have a, a non degenerate alternating form then the vector space has to be even dimensional and we will have a basis e 1 e 2 e n f 1 f 2 f n such that e i f j is delta i j and e i e i f j f j are all 0. Notice that this condition is equal to saying a x x is 0 because you can write a x a x plus y x plus y if you write down see <coughs> sorry uh, you, you write down a um, how do I say it a, a, just write a x x a x x because minus a x x so it has to be 0. I, I am always working with characters 0 remember. <coughs> So, and conversely, if Axx is zero, you conclude that Axy minus Ayx by looking at Ax plus y, x plus y. So Axx will be zero, Ax yy will be zero, and then Axy plus Ayx zero. So there exists if A is any non-degenerate form, any non-degenerate alternating form, there exists a basis. e 1 e 2 e n f 1 f 2 f n that means of course, the vector space is necessarily if it admits an alternating bilinear form it necessarily even dimension. There exists a basis e 1 e 2 e n f 1 f 2 f n such that A e i e i equals A f j f j equals 0 and A e i f j equals delta i j. Then of course, A f j A will be minus delta i j because it is alternating. So, that is the any alternating form looks like this and S p 2 and k is described as the group which leaves which is in the Lie algebra which leaves invariant this alternating form that is S p 2 and k. Because of this you see I do not in the case of uh, quadratic forms there can be very many different quadratic forms, but all non degenerate quadratic forms are essentially the same with respect to some suitable basis they all look alike. Whereas, orthogonal groups can be very different even our reals if you look at the group quadratic form in two variables x square plus y square for instance x y going to x square plus y square you can also look at x square going to x square minus y square. The two quadratic forms are not equivalent one is positive definite the other is not, but alternating forms are all the same by choosing a basis you can always put it in the same form. If you like if you use this basis sigma x i e i a f sigma x i a sigma y 
i i simply becomes sigma x i y j. Sorry, x i y i. That's what it becomes. E i and f j also make zero product. So the only terms that come x i y i e i. So I, I got it all wrong. Sorry. Sorry. Plus sigma y i f i comma. I, I, I didn't do it right. I'm sorry. I should put it like this. Sigma psi i e i plus sigma eta i f i equals x i eta i minus y i psi i. Now, I have to combine e i will give a non trivial part only with f i nothing else. So, when I combine that I get e i x i eta i then I combine f i and e i. So, the sign gets changed. So, I get a minus sign there. That is what it looks like. Anyway, the groups S p and k, I am assuming that the alternative form is in the specific form. I mean, it can be described as sorry, I know I know any alternative form can is equivalent to that, but anyway, S p and k can be defined as set of uh, x and m and k with the property that a x v w plus a v x w equal to 0, exactly as in the orthogonal case. 2 a? 2 a? 2 a, n, n. Oh, a 2 n k. That is the condition I want. Once again, it is a bilinear form being differentiated, if you like. So, A x v w plus A v x w has to be 0. Set of x satisfies this. This again turns out to be the algebra, and again you have to make the condition that n is equal to greater than equal to 2. There are also some low dimensional isomorphisms. All they are not all distinct. It turns out that S L n S L 2 k is same as S P 2 k. Is isomorphic to S P 2 k. And uh, <coughs> it's also it's it's also isomorphic to S O 3 but the quadratic form must be rather special. F equals f of x1, x2, x3 can be taken in the form x1 square plus x2, x3. If it is of this form, then you have this isomorphism. We also have an isomorphism of uh, take f in this form. So, f not let me write f not. It also turns out that S O 4 uh, <coughs> g not equals S O 3 f not. So, sorry S O 4 g not is uh, I should avoid here when I say they are simple algebras uh, n greater equal to 3 and n not equal to n not equal to 4. When n equals 4 may not be simple. It turns out to be like this product of two copies of 4, 3, where g not of x 1, x 2, x 3, x 4 is x 1, x 2 times x 3, x 4 plus x 3, x 4. Some low dimensional identifications happen. Otherwise, they are mutually non isomorphic. There are no other isomorphisms among these clear algebras, this list. And it is a basic structure theorem that over an algebraically closed field, every simple algebra 
is one of these or belong to a finite number of other isomorphism classes. It's a finite number and those Lie algebras have been given names over complex numbers up to isomorphism. There are only five other Lie algebras, simple Lie algebras, five simple Lie algebras other than this list, than those in this list. And these are usually denoted <coughs> E6, E7, E8, F4 and G2. Those are names due to this Lie algebra. For example, G2 is described as the Lie algebra of, uh, let us think over something like R or think over R, then over R there are the scaly numbers, scaly octaves, eight dimensional algebra which is uh, <coughs> and the automorphisms of that algebra is the Lie group and the Lie algebra of that group is G2, Lie algebra of that Lie group is G2. Anyway, the point is that there is a completely satisfactory classification which tells you that these groups which I have listed here, they are called classical groups. The classical groups and one other point I want to make. The orthogonal group, I said, depends on the quadratic form. But over an algebraically closed field, there is only one quadratic form up to isomorphism. There is always a, there is a basis very similar to the kind of basis we have here. See here, we had a basis E1 E T A such that E i F j is delta i j. But over complex numbers, you can again get a basis. Again, if it is 2 n dimensional, you can get a basis with E i F j equal to delta i j. If it is 2n plus 1 dimensional, you get e1, e2n, f1, f2, f1 plus one more vector. But these vectors will have the same property a, fj equal to delta ij. Of course, fi, fj here will be also delta ij because it is a symmetric situation. So, over complex numbers, there is essentially only one quadratic form up to isomorphism. So, the Lie algebra of the orthogonal group is well defined. There is no ambiguity about it. Up to isomorphism, there is only one. Similarly, for the symplectic group, so symplectic Lie algebra, and of course, SLN is well defined, there is no problem there. So, th these are infinite families. Apart from these infinite families, there are only finitely many groups which are called exceptional Lie, Lie algebras, are called exceptional Lie algebras. Okay. And they have some of them, uh, in fact, uh, E6 is a description as odd, the uh, Lie, uh, you know as the, the Lie group correspond to E6 as a description as automorphisms of a, what are called a, what is it called a Jordan algebra. But I mean these are all very special esoteric things you just cannot uh, do any, I mean there, the, very often uh, if you want to deal with exceptional groups you it is good to have a standard realization. And E7, E8 I do not know myself, I myself do not remember there are some realizations but I, I never looked at these things. So, I do not really know <coughs> what they are what the characterization is. However, handling them is usually done through something called root systems. I will tell you a little bit about root systems. I cannot really go into details. What happens is this. First, let us look at the group SLNK. SLNK has a rather special set of the Lie algebra as a basis as a vector space. Yeah, okay. I I already said that the same simple Lie algebra is necessarily a product of simple Lie algebra. How does one prove such a statement? There is a theorem which I cannot uh, go into due to Lie Cartan. Which has gives another characterization of a same simple Lie algebra. The characterization goes like this. First, for that I need the notion 
of, a, of the killing form. Killing was a German mathematician. Nothing to do with killing. <laughs> killing form of a linear algebra. This is the form. So G is a linear algebra. We have. I'm going to give a defined symmetric bilinear form from G cross G to G to back to the field K. Namely, X Y going to trace add X add Y. Add x is a endomorphism of the linear algebra, and so is add y. When I compose the two, I get new, new endomorphism. When I take the product of the two, I get a new endomorphism. I take its trace. And this is a symmetric bilinear form because trace of xy, we know is trace of yx for any pair of matrices. For any endomorphism, say b, trace ab is trace b. So what you get is a symmetric bilinear form. And Cartan's theorem tells you that this symmetric bilinear form is non-degenerate. The for a sim simple algebra, if or for a sim simple algebra, if G is sim if G is sim simple, so all characteristic zero is sim simple. If and only if the killing form is non-degenerate. The killing form is invariant to in the following sense. I suppose I call this Kxy. Turns, it has a, we have the property K add x on y, comma z is k <coughs> sorry plus k x sorry k y add x on z is 0. That is the kind of thing we did here for bilinear forms. It is invariant in the adjoint action. <coughs> here we <have> said <coughs> the matrix x acts on the vector space b f x v plus b f v x w equals 0 is what I said. And exactly analogous statement we are replacing that matrix is there by add x. <coughs> and so the killing form has this property. It is it's an invariant bilinear form on the Lie algebra. See the invariance, you know, x acts like differentiation. So that's why invariance takes on this form. Invariance under the, the action of the Lie algebra, because Lie algebra action is by differentiation, so to speak. So we call this thing invariance under the Lie algebra. This kind of condition. So the killing form, if the killing form is non-degenerate, then the Lie algebra is semi simple. And conversely, one way is not so difficult to prove. The other way is more complicated because what happens is this: <coughs> if uh, see, if you take yeah, <coughs> if the Lie algebra if the killing form is not, suppose assume that the killing form is not degenerate. Suppose it has an abelian ideal. Okay. Look at element, so suppose k is non degenerate, the killing form k is non degenerate, and a in G is an abelian ideal. Then what happens? Take an element x in A and take any y in G. What does add x add y do? Add x kills A. Add x add y will map G into A and then gets killed again. So trace add x add y is always 0 for x in A and any y in G, which will prove the, which will contradict the non-degeneracy. If A is non zero, you have a non zero x here, such that trace add x add y is zero all the time. 
So that's easy to prove. If you know that the killing form is non-degenerate, it has no abelian ideals. But the converse is a little more delicate. It's considerably delicate. It's one of the central theorems in the structure theory. And I'm not going to prove it now. Because this is somewhat takes time to prove that stuff. But that holds the key to the whole thing. And once you have the killing form is non-degenerate, what happens? Suppose you have an I take a simple, simple Lie algebra, the killing form is non-degenerate. Take an ideal and take the now we have a bilinear form. You can talk of the orthogonal complement of any subspace. That is, all vectors which are orthogonal to the subspace with respect to the killing form. So if you have G Lie algebra, K killing form, which is assumed to be non-degenerate, take A and G an ideal. And look at the set of, I do not by A perp, the set of vectors x and g such that k x y is 0 for every y in A. The orthogonal, this is the orthogonal complement. The usual way you make orthogonal complement with respect to the standard inner product in Euclidean space, you do it with k. k may not be positive different, but I don't care. I can define this. A perp and is easily seen to be an ideal because of the invariance of the killing form. You can easily see that if k x y is 0, <coughs> and if you take bracket of x and so k of z x, if you take comma y, this can be shifted to the other side. This is for every y, and z y is an ideal. And a is an ideal, so z y will be in the ideal, so it will still be 0. So you find that this is what you get is this is an ideal and its intersection with A has to be 0 because anything common to A and A perp will be orthogonal to both A and A perp and so non-degeneracy will be contradicted. So you find G becomes A plus A perp. It directs some, both are ideals. So by obviously by some indexed on dimension you see that everything it breaks up into direct sum of simple ideals, simple algebras. That's the bracket of A and A perp is also 0. Because A is an ideal, A perp is an ideal, and their intersection is 0. So if we take x here, y there, bracket x, y will fall into the intersection, which will be 0. So every semi simple algebra <coughs> falls in, breaks up into product of simple, simple, simple algebras. And for simple algebras, so for, if you want to classify all semi simple algebras, you have to classify simple algebras. And I've told you what the list of simple algebras is already. Okay. <clears throat> All this over an algebraically closed field. That's a, the classification I mentioned is strictly over an algebraically closed field. And then for a general fields, there is some elaborate theory. In particular, for one has good inf complete information in the case of real fields, one has a complete classification. One has also good classification over periodic fields. But are all pretty com complicated. The basic idea is that uh, you go to the algebraic closure, classify there, and come back by some kind of what they call Galois descent. So there, the idea is this. You have a, say, Lie algebra. Uh, I take the base field k and tensor Lie algebra with the algebraic closure of k over k. Then you get a certain Lie algebra which you know what it is because the classification tells you. So then what you have to do, you have to see different, you have, you have to look at fixed, some complex Lie algebra, and you are looking at all Lie algebras, which after tensoring with k bar, becomes isomorphic to that Lie algebra. This classification is uh, handled by what is known as Galois cohomology. That's, I mean, at that percent it's only a word, but uh, you shouldn't be afraid of it. At some point, if you see the word, see something like Galois cohomology, don't be scared. It's quite easy to understand what's going on there. There are always, of course, once you get deeper into the subject, there are always difficult theorems and so on. But the definition of Galois cohomology is not that difficult. It's not uh, <coughs> formidable. So uh, that's the way general classification is done. 
Well, what more do I want to say at this point? Yeah, there's one more thing that should be said. You have this G. Any, if you take, start with any Lie algebra, then you know that there's a soluble radical and you have the quotient G by R, which we know is semi simple. It turns out that this actually splits that the Lie algebra injection the other direction such that the composite is identity. In other words, <laughs> G is actually a semi direct product of G by R and R. You, you have to make the definition of semi direct product. I have not given it, but if you have a Lie algebra G, which is acting on another Lie algebra by, you know, if you take x in g, y in r, the bracket makes sense. And that is a, well, let me also make one other definition, which I should have probably said in the very beginning. But anyway, if g is a Lie algebra, a derivation of g is a Lie it's a linear map d from g to g such that d of bracket a b equals d a comma b plus a bracket d b. Once again, it's something like Leibniz formula. There's a product, some kind of product you're taking here. Differentiation of product is first term derived into the product, the product is second term, and then first term product with second term, D differentiated version of the second term. So such a thing is called a derivation. Add x, g to g is a derivation. This is nothing but the Jacobi identity. Go through that. You write down this condition. What do you get? X bracket AB equals bracket XAB plus A bracket XB. And that after some jump, jugglery, I mean some permutation, is simply Jacobi identity. Okay. So add X is a derivation, for instance. But anyway, so a derivation of Lie algebra is this. Suppose you have Lie algebra G. Ah, so the set of derivations of Lie algebra. is a Lie algebra under the operation under d1 d2 going to d1 d2 minus d2 d1. That's reminiscent of what we did with vector fields. d1 is a linear map of the Lie algebra into itself. So d2 d1 is also a linear map. That is no longer a derivation. And so is d1, d2. But if you subtract d1, d2, d1, d2 minus d2, d1, what you end up in a derivation. So routine checking, it's quite easy to see. So the set of derivations of Lie algebra is a Lie algebra under this operation. And then with this, one can define the notion of a semi-direct product. Suppose G is a Lie algebra. And H is another Lie algebra. And suppose rho G to derivations of H is a Lie algebra homomorphism. Then on the direct sum, G direct sum H, I can define a Lie algebra structure. As follows, how do I do it? If I take two elements of G, G is a Lie algebra in its own right, I take its bracket. If I take two elements of H, it's a Lie algebra in its own right, I take the bracket of the two. So I'll have to see what these two. When I take one here and one there, what happens? So x in g 
and y in h define bracket x y to be equal to x is an element of g. So, rho x is a derivation of h, I can apply it to y. This is natural definition of a bracket. And you know it is kind of consistent, you, if it is going to be linear algebra, add x, bracket, taking bracket with x has to be a derivation and you have given that there already. It is a derivation. <coughs> so, then this is called the semi direct product. So, I should put a row here to indicate I am using, I need this row, I need some row to be able to define that. This is semi direct product by definition, semi direct product of G and H. Now, you have the notion of semi-direct product in groups. So, if you have a Lie group G and another group H and suppose G acts as, automorph as an automorphism group of H, you can form the semi-direct product. That is how we do that. And if you take the corresponding Lie algebras, you get when G acts on H, the Lie algebra of G acts on the Lie algebra of H as derivations as you can easily check. And so, the semi-direct product of G and H as groups, capital G, capital H as groups, Roman G, Roman H as groups, is precisely the similar part of the Lie algebra of G and Lie algebra of H. So, that is how the similar product has, has a parallel to what happens in group theory. So, here what has happened is this, if you, if you are, G is the Lie algebra, R it is radical and G by R is a some simple thing. What we are saying it splits here, the similar so, and then inside here, this is, a, this is an ideal. So, G by R acts on this and so, you can form the semi direct product and that is precisely what G is. So, G is a semi direct product of G by R and R. So, there is a natural action of G by R on R. Once you are splitting, you get an action of G by R on R because R is an ideal and it becomes a semi direct product. So, the structure theory for a general Lie algebra is reduced to studying soluble Lie algebras on the one hand, semi simple Lie algebras on the other hand, and finally, actions of semi simple Lie algebras and soluble Lie algebras. So, by and large, the most important uh, Lie algebras are the semi simple Lie algebras because soluble one can see can you have some considerable control over what happens inside a soluble group, soluble Lie algebra. So, and then uh, uh, these things have corresponding statements in Lie groups. So, if you talk to the Lie group, it turns out it has a maximum soluble subgroup and if the quotient G by R is a semi simple Lie group, the Lie, Lie group is semi simple, the Lie algebra is semi simple, and then the Lie group becomes essentially a product of what we call simple Lie groups. Simple, in the sense it will be simple modulo a discrete central subgroup. That will be the kind. It won't, you cannot uh, always say, like Lie algebra, it has, you cannot say it has no non zero ideals, you cannot have, the, you cannot say it has no normal subgroups, it can have discrete normal subgroups, which are necessarily central, of course. So, the general structure theory is that anything is a semi direct product not quite, you have to be careful. Once again, uh, if you take uh, what happens in the case of Lie groups is that in the case of real Lie groups is you have to go to a suitable covering, then it becomes a symmetric product of the kind. You cannot say that given the group it is automatically symmetric product, but a finite covering always does the job. That kind of you know, finite or sometimes infinite covering. If you, if, if you replace G by its simply connected cover, you will be in good shape. Then you can certainly what you want. So, the structure theory of Lie algebra goes a long way in determining the structure, structure of Lie groups themselves. Okay, I think I have uh, come to the end of my time and I do not think I can say anything more sensibly in the, in, even if I have another hour just now. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. <laughs>